Hello, Internet. Hello and welcome, everyone. This is State of Exile, episode 35, with the big dog, Chris Wilson. How's it going, Chris? <laughs> hey, it's going well, thanks. How are things? Awesome. Well, we appreciate you guys uh, always stepping up and coming along to these uh, community-ran podcasts. This is your fourth time being on the show now. It means a lot to the community. Thank you again. It's no problem. Happy to be here. I think that makes Chris one of our most recurring guests then, even over like Rise or someone who's been over on like three times. Yeah, Chris, you were the most popular guest now. Maybe I need to join the crew. <laughs> yep. No. I love that one. <laughs> Permanent guest, guest Chris. <laughs> <laughs> that actually be pretty awesome. Uh, what do we got going on today? So the first hour of this show will be with the lead dev, Chris Wilson. If you guys aren't aware of what he does, it's pretty much everything. He even posted his sleep tracker on Reddit, which wasn't very much, sort of the, <laughs> the week leading up to patch 2.0. So he, he does everything. Um, for the most part, though, you know, he does have a lot of devs that handle a little bit more of the game balance. So the questions we're asking him are primarily 2.0 questions. In terms of what's to come in the future... You know, we'll save that for a later show. So this is going to be an Awakening podcast. Um, we might tease a little bit of future stuff here and there, maybe. We'll, we'll, we'll try, guys, but no promises. <laughs> it's hard to avoid it. It's hard to help. You're always excited about what's coming next. We just Even when you get a massive everything. expansion. We want to know everything. Enough. And there are good updates to the Awakening coming out that we can talk about. Oh, sweet. Good. That's what I awesome. wanted to, to start Excellent. with. So Thank let's... Yeah, maybe, maybe we could start right there. Um, there's a new uh, kind of... Point one patch coming up uh, briefly. Do you have a bit of an overview of what's going to be in that? So the 201 patch is kind of the first content update and we found that the um, we've actually been able to squeeze quite a lot of updates into the 200 point releases like G and H. So we have like for example an H patch coming out today that has a bunch more improvements and those ones there are mostly um, performance improvements and bug fixes. We've been saving some of the new actual content for 201 and Excellent. we have a few interesting areas that we've been looking at improving. The first one is we've wanted to add more to both Warbands and Tempest. And so we've been foreshadowing this Chaos faction for a while for Warbands, and so players will finally get a chance to face off against them. And um, they're going to be maps only and pretty pretty awesome, as far as I can see. Get that Chaos Resist going, guys. <laughs> yep, so the, the Chaos Mark faction are essentially Warbands leaders that have dissented and decided not to, you know, to go with the flow of the rest of their Warband. And so you get to um, find them in some pretty interesting situations. In addition, we've been looking at um, adding some more Tempests. These aren't ones that count towards the challenge, we're just adding them because they're cool, and that will help provide variety for people who are playing a lot of Tempest League this season. Thank you very much. More yes. Tempests. Yeah. That's okay. And there's also um, some new endgame maps coming. I think there's at least the core map, which is based on the Harvest, so that's got the map version of Malachi, and that's just intended to be ridiculous, so no whining when that's impossibly difficult, because that's what it's there for. Yes. No whining. That is no whining. Stated. It's right in Oh man, the Merciless one alone is brutal, so I <laughs> can't imagine that one is going to be insane. Yeah, well it's difficult striking the right point. Um, obviously you want a challenge for some players and you want other players to actually be able to progress through the game. So it's interesting getting the various forms of Malachi so that some of them don't block progress, but others ones are, other ones are very difficult. How do you make something like that, uh, which is already very high damage in Merciless and, uh, you know, like some of the abilities are tuned to be one-shots with wind-ups and stuff, how do you uh, how do you balance something like that for a higher map? Do you add, like, more abilities to the fight or do you do, do you scale the damage up further? What's the, what's the strategy? So honestly, yet, I have not played the map. And this is partly because I want to see it once it's actually finished to give good feedback on it, but I don't know the answer to your question. I'm looking forward to it, ah. though, and I probably will find out and can let you know before it's released. But it You'll should be, be doing some balance testing with us, eh? <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually it's really nice to be able to play something once it's ready, because then you get to see it as the players do, because otherwise you're kind of blinded to a lot of the problems during the development process. Like, I mean, I had my fingers in Tempest every single day for four months, so it's very difficult to get an objective opinion of whether the league is good overall. Whereas something mm. like this map fight, I can play just like a player would. That's an interesting uh, position to take like as a lead developer to uh, let this, the team handle some things and then come to them later and give your opinions after the fact. Is that something you'll use, pr use pretty often? I actually use like it that? quite a lot with Act 4 itself because the art team primarily makes the acts. They do the quests, they do the monsters, you know, the whole lot is just handled by Eric's division. So I left um, Act 4, I hadn't seen it until actually, well, late 2014, which is quite late considering it started work in 2013. So the first time I actually saw Act 4 was when Green Dude came over um, and we were talking about PvP stuff, so we decided to have a look at Act 4 together. So he was seeing it at the same time as me. Whoa. Mm, okay, interesting. 
That must take a lot of restraint to keep yourself that far back from the mountain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no I, spoilers. I, <laughs> I knew what was going on. Like, I could tell you the areas and what monsters are in them and how the quests worked. I just hadn't actually played through on a real character and experienced, like, the Duresso pit fights and so on for the first time. And that area blew me away. I mean, I remember saying at the time, because we were working on the PvP stuff, that this would make an amazing um, hideout for Leo to have. Ah, yes. Uh, speaking of uh, Act 4, the beta process, how would you guys consider it? Would you consider it a success? How would you, uh, and if you do, what are some things in the beta process that you would uh, consider again in the future that to do and not do? So we feel the beta was a success because we got masses of feedback and data, and it meant that when we launched The Awakening, we weren't surprised by instance crashes or core problems that we were able to identify in the beta. And we had like three or four staff members basically just processing feedback all day long from the players and one of the things that surprised us about the beta process is that um, it wasn't a live economy like players knew there were wipes coming and this actually changed the way they behaved you know they'd use vile orbs more often than they normally would and they wouldn't necessarily um, you know trade in chaos sets of vendor recipes as often to you know accumulate wealth within the league and we find this gradually began to distort the player behavior in the beta so mm. the takeaway from that is in the future betas are really good for a few weeks or while the players are taking them quite seriously but if you have too many cycles within a beta the player behavior gradually begins to degrade over time as people look for short-term gains rather than the long-term ones yeah okay, that's, that's so actually I an interesting too. insight yeah definitely affected the way i played and tested Near the end of every wipe, I just spam chaos on jewels to hope I get like that one good jewel, and I would never do that in you know standard. Just to play. take a screenshot of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why? Why be efficient when it's just like, well, it doesn't matter in a couple of days. Move on. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We also found that. Um, we obviously had a marketing deadline to release the actual awakening, so we had to pick a uh, a point that we were going to release the game, which was July 10th, as you know. And if we were able to predict that further in advance, like to actually work out the point that the Awakening would be ready, we could have given people um, better notice of how long the beta would be. And we think that would have helped quite a lot because then we could, you know, people would have a better understanding of the length of the leagues they were playing in. Yeah, it's obviously better for, you know, people who are investing in not and not just to know when all that stuff is going to be done. That would have been nice, but programming doesn't uh, lend itself to that all the time. Yeah, well, we're pleased with how it went overall, though, and we're not guaranteeing betas for future content. I mean, it's a, a lengthy process that takes a ton of overhead, but for something as large as The Awakening, it's certainly useful. Hmm. I think, well, I certainly feel like um, things were a bit better balanced and uh, less buggy than previous uh, major content releases, even if there was still some balancing done in the first couple of days of the league. How much was the beta for balance versus for finding bugs from your guys' perspective? It's mostly for finding bugs. The balance issue is that our beta players represent um, like extremely hardcore players. You know, yeah. you don't get new players fresh off the street coming into the beta. Well, you get a few, and that was very useful. Once we identified who they were, players with no history, we were able mm -hmm. to look at their feedback almost exclusively for certain types of data-driven stuff. You know, like oh wow, these guys aren't getting past Mervale or whatever the you know the problem was. Whereas of course everyone else mm -hmm. is breezing past. Uh, Mervale isn't a case, isn't a good example in this case. But so we. Um, found it very useful to segment the players when we we're looking at feedback like that. So then, after the feedback in the beta, you then introduced it. Obviously, we have the Awakening release. What feedback most surprised you? You did mention the Eternal Orb uh, in the Reddit post, but beyond that? Well, the Eternal Orb thing is just that I expected more backlash, and that's because it's removing something that some players were using. And while I and many of the other players agreed that it's a good thing for them to not be in the game for a while, um, it, I was expecting more, you know, you've ruined my crafting odds and so on. Having said that, the people who had the eternal lobs are now filthy rich, so I guess yeah. they're happy either <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah, the people who had them are complaining. <laughs> the people who didn't yeah. have them didn't have them anyway, so don't really have anything to complain about. So, right. yeah, um, not I'm, much I'm actual backlash. Talk happy to talk more about the eternal orbs, but to answer your question of what surprised us, um, to some extent it's the smallest things, like item filters. We added them because people wanted them, but we were amazed to see the amount that it, it changed the game for people. Like, like, here's an example. People are finding more items now. Like, just the rate of exalts that people are dropping up, uh, picking up is just higher. And this is because they're finding things that were off screen. You know, you put down a flame totem, it fights some monsters, you walk away, an eternal, uh, an exalt drops, and you can run back and pick it up because you hear the sound. So, yeah, the sound by, by themselves, so they're basically a buff to item find rates. And that's something we hadn't necessarily factored in economically when we were looking at adding item filters. <laughs> 
Well, there's certainly uh, <laughs> certainly been a buff to the amount of chromatics available in the economy. No one wants yeah. chromatics because everyone's got those chromatic filters on and picks them right. all up and gets plenty. We also explicitly buffed the rate that chromatic items drop. Like, we sat down and fiddled with the ah. math to just make it easier to get low numbers of sockets. So previously, mm. you'd often find one socket, frequently find two, and occasionally find three. Now, three is probably in the frequently category. And we didn't change four, five, and six in that process, but one, two, and three, we changed a lot because now that we're introducing support gems earlier, it's just more important that people have colored sockets in the right places. Mm. So that's why no Very one true. needs crimes then, because you buff them and people are using filters to find them even more. <laughs> Honestly, yep. I, oh. item filters are so popular right now. Like They're almost as popular as, hey, what build are you playing? It's, hey, what <coughs> item filter are you using? I could see like on the forums itself just being dedicated item filters being discussed as much as builds in the future. Mm. And this is so partly the... Oh, sorry, sorry. I, was, I was gonna say this is partly the motivation behind them being shareable things. You know, a guy makes one and people feel good about um, you know, the fact they're using his one. Exactly. Well, was there anything that you were really excited about but the community didn't quite respond or were kind of indifferent to? So, gem quest rewards, like the way that as you play through the game, the quest rewards are much more consolidated. You're getting three or four options rather than eight or so, and that the rest are available the gem vendors. It was a change that in our testing we saw was massive. Like when our developers would go online to play the Exiles Everywhere or flashback events and they were missing the you know the gem structure that we had in the Awakening, that was the thing that we internally felt was the biggest deal for you know, just general playthroughs of the game. And people are certainly engaging with the system, right? We see tons of players taking these gem vendor um, options, but no one's really talking about it as being a big game changer. It's just kind of accepted as that's the way things should be. Well, I'm, I'm, cra I'm very surprised by that. I love gem vendors. I, I rave about it all the time. It's uh, had one of the biggest impacts. I was Maybe more we appreciative of that over filters. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Oh, over filters? I don't know. They're it's, nice it's, for the... it's in the top three, maybe, but <laughs> but below filters, I'd say. <laughs> they're, they're nice for the class you're playing, but like, let's say I, I have a character that's level 80 or something, and I need a blood magic gem for my sign who doesn't get that from the gem vendor. I can't just buy a level 1 blood magic for her. So, you know, there's still some economy behind the gems, but it's like, it can be a good thing and a frustrating thing at the same time. Overall, I'm really happy with it, though. Fair enough. Well, we generally so found the... that he... Oh, oh sorry, about I was just I was gonna, gonna say, say for the opposite question, was there anything yeah. you didn't think much of that got a ton of praise? Um, that's kind of the point I was raising with the item filters thing, that it was just something that people asked for that we did. You know, like having party leaders be blue on the minimap. We, we didn't realize the extent to which, I mean, to some extent, the praising of lockstep was also something that we knew would happen, but people were definitely much more appreciative than we thought. You didn't think people would be so excited about loot filters as they were? Hmm? Right. And I mean, it's it, it's a nice thing to have, but we didn't realize the extent to which it would dictate people's um, you know future. Yeah, fair enough. I feel like, um, oh, that's, that's what I was curious about, actually. Do you guys like roughly know how many people are using loot filters out of the people playing? I think the stats are available. I haven't looked at them myself. Um, it's a client-side setting, so we try not to report too much of that back to the server, but I'm pretty sure that if a crash occurs, we do send information like that, and so we could look at the percentage of people who crashed who were using loot filters, which might be a distorted number, but it's probably in the right ballpark. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's an interesting way of getting the data, I suppose. <coughs> So uh, we have a question here from the community uh, community member Tuatho, who's uh, who said that since the recent act, I've become a bit of a law nerd. So I'm curious about how the story writing works at GGG, considering the plethora of delivery methods, unique descriptions, NPC discussions, and lore items, etc. Is there a cohesive design documents that you guys refer to for the story and lore, um, or is the lore sort of come about in small independent chunks and been tied together over time? Well, we have quite a lot of shared documents with the staff um, for balance, law, design, and that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's it's very frequent that someone will make a document saying, hey, I think that Emperor so-and-so did this thing here, and then, you know, the people will flesh it out over time, and it so eventually makes its way into, like, you know, law stones and so on in the game. And there's basically five staff who like to work on law. There's Edwin, who's our primary writer, uh, Reese, Eric, Eric's our creative director, Brian, and Nick. And they all do various different specialities. Like, for example, Nick really likes coming up with um, flavor for things like challenge leagues and working on flavor text for uniques. And he's processing um, divination cards and making sure they fit in with the law. So these five developers will generally share these documents around, flesh them out, and then it's useful for the rest of the team to draw from when making content. 
Mm, so it's a bit of a group writing effort rather than just sort of having one person having written a pre-written a story. Sure, though often someone like Edwin, who's a primary writer, will write a thing that's you know is complete as far as he's concerned, and then other people will come in and find either discrepancies or places that they feel could be changed to you know further align with the themes we have elsewhere. And so it'll it'll often have one person doing a first draft, then everyone else chipping in. Mm, okay, interesting. Uh, the next question I have for you here before we go into the general balance uh, category is um, with all the new bosses coming out and um, people's uh, computers not really being optimized for it, uh, how is it weighing you know, on these more impressive looking b- boss fights against play- players with issues um, you know, in general? You know, have you been getting a lot of feedback with uh, people with poor computers wishing that there was a way to tone down things like the blood example when you kill a heart on Malachi? It's a little over the top for some people. <laughs> Our developers are pretty aware of the performance ramifications of techniques that they choose. And so there's always a trade-off between, you know, hurting people with slow computers and providing a game that looks good for everyone else. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. (coughs) We could make the game um, have potato graphics for everyone, but that hurts. (laughs) Well, I mean the immersion, right? You know, the the other 80% of players who do have contemporary machines and do actually want a game that looks okay to play. So we do try to make sure that it's not too bad on lower machines, but a lot of this is honestly the push to take the user data um, of what's slow and then to fix it up after the fact once we actually have an idea of what's slow because premature optimization is a bit of an issue when you spend a lot of time trying to make sure something's not slow and then that's not the thing at all that people are complaining about. I'm curious if the designers, uh, like the art designers and stuff, or uh, you, you guys have a, like a local version that was much more insane and then you had to turn it down for release. That often happens with uh, game design, especially for like AAA games where they have, a, they have to really tone it down before they bring it out for console or something like that. Do you guys have a similar sort of thing or is it pretty much what gets made uh, ends up coming out? So we have the excuse that because of on a PC there's you know a wide range of different settings, we can release almost anything and it will work on someone's computer. But we do look before release at what percentage of people are affected by something that's particularly performance heavy, and it'll often receive optimization passes as opposed to toning it down. I mean, there are a couple of cases where things will have to be changed so that they they work in a faster way, but typically it's it highlights an area in the engine that we can improve in order to make it more efficient. Hmm. Okay. Makes sense. All right, so we're going to be going into general balance discussions, more of the hard-hitting questions that the community really want answers for here, Chris, so good luck. All right, so I've got one for you then. Um, how, how do you feel about the transition? There's obviously a ton of flack about this, but going from Act <coughs> 4, end content difficulty, transitioning to the beginning of Act 1 in the new difficulty, so Cruel or Merciless, we're not necessarily talking about how hard the end content was and it's been adjusted, but how do you feel about that difficulty curve in gearing, etc., mob damage? Also known as the holiday on Twilight Strand. <laughs> <laughs> so Act 4 being difficult did play into this quite a lot um, because it, it's an even larger juxtaposition after you got through the 2.0.0 movie, uh, sorry, uh, Malachi fight as opposed to the 2.0.0 G Malachi fight, which is a lot easier. And it really is a lot e- easier now. So that was quite a stark difference. There are two factors that contribute to Cruel Act 1 being easier. The first one is that the monsters just don't really do like anything particularly exciting with the AI. I mean, it's designed for mm-hmm. new players because it's the beginning of Cruel. So they kind of lumber around and occasionally hit you. And on the other hand, the Act 4 monsters actually have quite a lot of buffs to their abilities because they're meant to be end-of-game monsters. So you see them typically have... We use these like internal effectiveness values, and they have like 120%, 130% for various stats because they're Act 4 monsters. And when you drop back down to cruel Act 1 monsters that are just at 100% like normal monsters, it is actually easier. Now, we have looked at various other games that do tiered difficulty levels like this, and they typically do drop down and pace again at the beginning of the next act because of the AI thing, but not because of the stats thing. And I've talked to the balance team about this a fair amount, and we had a number of ways we could go here. Uh, my personal feeling, and this isn't shared by most of the rest of the balance team, but my personal feeling is that the beginning of Crawl and Merciless could be quite a lot harder. Like, I kind of imagine, my, in my ideal situation, the zombies are basically, you know, going to take half your life off. If they hit you, you just have to be incredibly careful that they don't. And that's okay, because they're relatively, um, you know, bad AI monsters. Mechanically easy to deal with. Plus one yeah, to this idea. Yes. Yeah, so the, the difficulty is, though, they've tried this kind of stuff before, and it really can be very dangerous to give that much of a buff to white monsters. So in the mm. 
um, the full game balance that we went with the Awakening, it's as, as it is at the moment with a view to gradually going in that direction. But we, at the moment we don't want to be buffing um, those monsters just off the cuff without doing substantial testing. So while the Awakening had a lot of rebalance in it that we're not planning to you know, do another rebalance again in the near future, it's the kind of thing that I'd like to achieve longer term. And there are other options here, like just adding more interesting abilities to the cruel variations of monsters, or you know, t t turning up the optional content that makes it harder in cruel, for example. You know, there's more tormented spirits or something like that. I mean, these are different ways we can approach making cruel not so much of a holiday. Hmm, I'm okay with the idea. I, I actually always kind of liked in action RPGs that when you go back to Act One, it's a little bit of a holiday. But uh, I feel that the holiday extends a little... You know, when you have a holiday and it just goes for a bit too long? Well, it goes for, like, the first three acts <laughs> at the moment. So I feel like it may be going for a bit long. I like the idea of maybe things getting a bit harder since they are more mechanically simpler. Mm -hmm. right. one, way to, one way to relatively easily uh, do that is to do it on the rare monsters. Like, to say that in Cruel, okay, look, it's going to be kind of, you know, straightforward killing the normal monsters, but there's big spikes of difficulty when you encounter rare monsters. That requires a lot less um, iterative balance tuning to get right. Something I, one of my favorite challenge leagues was actually Nemesis because it made rare monsters actually noticeable and scary and you had to think about them. So uh, having like the rare monsters and the champion monsters actually feel like kind of like mini bosses and champions would... Uh, Feels like a good idea. Interesting idea, yeah. Something that'd be pretty interesting. I'll share it with the team. It's worth noting that I don't actually work on that exact numeric balance stuff at all. So they have their own reasons for doing what they do and I'm probably wrong, but I figured I'd share my own opinion with it. <laughs> Um, Why would we want your opinion? You're only a guest. <laughs> 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 Alright, so Good the point. next question we have here is um, what are your feelings about one-shot mechanics in ARPGs? Obviously with the introduction of Malachi, there was a lot of flack. He's too hard. He hits me too hard. I don't have enough armor. I'm being one-shot. Um, do you feel in particular Malachi was overtuned, or was that the point? The one... There was a mechanic to one-shot you, and it's completely up to player skill whether or not to get hit by it. So there's a lot of different things in play here. Um, we're generally okay with one-shot, well, I'm going to say large damage things, if they're well-signaled and they don't one-shot people who have specifically tried to mitigate that type of attack. Like, if there's just an attack that you can't not be killed by, then, of course, that's problematic. So we're generally okay with mechanics that are signaled and do quite a lot of damage, and especially with the introduction of lockstep, um, it's much easier for players to pick up on the signals because they're actually happening. With regard to Malachi, I mean, I definitely think that he was... I don't like the word overtuned, but I definitely feel that he was doing too much damage, and this is part of the reason why, when looking at players' feedback, we adjusted the damage down twice significantly. And um, I don't yet have the collated feedback on how he currently fares, you know, as far as the players are concerned, but no one's complaining, so I guess he's, he's not particularly lethal anymore and normal and cruel. Having said that, I hope people are being one-shot on Merciless if they're not playing properly. Well, I think their yeah. services are definitely not making as much money on him. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a risky service before, though. Still, like, like a Malachi kill for a couple of chaos when he could one-shot you in Cruel. <laughs> yeah, I, I still saw some people dying to it. It was pretty good. I mean, the difference between playing an armor character my first playthrough with Fortify Endurance Charges, and I like could just face tank him, and then playing a caster with just a granite, it was like night and day terrifying. <coughs> but I... I mean, the boss is what it is, and it's honestly Malachi, despite doing high damage numbers in endgame maps, I'm sure he's going to do, and in Merciless, he's kind of like the opposite of its series. Series are like a very, um, they're both mechanical fights, but Malachi is more armor related type mechanics, and its series definitely more spell type mechanics. So I like that there, one build may be good with one, but not the other. Yeah, we like players pigeonholing their, like they build a character to do a thing. This is my guy that I'm going to do maps with, he's a generalist. This is my character I'm going to farm for at Zeri Fragments. This is the one we're actually going to kill at Zeri with, and so on and so on. Yeah, I like that. So then, with the addition of the Act 4 content, there's the length of the game. Now, you did trim and, let's say, streamline some of the zones, some of the map spawns. Um, how do you guys feel, or how has the feedback been with the extended length, I mean, the entire leveling overhaul? with Act 4 being uh, introduced? We're pretty happy with it. Uh, most of the feedback's been positive, and looking at the data has been good. We basically can see what percentage of players will drop off at various points during the game, right? With a free-to-play game, and you throw millions of people at it, people are going to drop off at various points. I mean, a large portion of players sees the opening beach and then quits for whatever reason. I mean, a large portion is an exaggeration, but some players will quit at the opening beach, and I'm sure you've seen the Steam stats where, like, 45% yeah. of players didn't get past Brutus or whatever, and that's pretty typical for free-to-play games. I mean, more than one I've installed and then only made it five minutes in before I, you know, frown at their cash shop or whatever it is. 
So we can see at what point people leave. And previously there were some extended, relatively boring parts, you know, like the Solaris Temple and the four sewers levels you had to go through, where we couldn't find a balance reason for people giving up at that point. And it didn't have to be yeah. many people giving up. But the <laughs> fact that there was, you know, oh, wow, 120 players over the last, you know, 2 million just stopped here. And we don't know why, you know, it's unexplained. <laughs> And that, I love that you guys had stats saying that uh, you know this this many thousand people quit in Solaris Temple. <laughs> so I, I tried three times to make it through this zone, but I can't. Still can't. I've been here for three hours. That's it. I quit. Well, none of those were particularly big problems, right? In the grand scheme of things, but we figured we'd tighten them up a bit more. And you learn so much by having years of people playing through an act compared to the design that you initially have when you make it. So it's good to revamp the older content. And while we can't afford to go and you know make Act One look all beautiful like they did in World of Warcraft when they revamped stuff in Cataclysm, we um, certainly can at least go and tweak the sizes of levels and arrange the order of them. I mean, like in Act 2, moving Oak so he was on the front side of the Val Ruins was a difficult decision for us to make. You know, it's literally moving a boss fight and shuffling the areas around quite a lot, but no one complained about that, and it seemed to be a good change. Great change. Now you can actually get your life before you even burn the thing, you know. I, I like that change personally, because it... One of the most confusing things when I first started playing this game is like, where is Oak? I can't find Oak, you know? And then I found the, the tree roots. I'm like, well, I can't get to Oak. How do I do that, you know? And it was like one of the best changes I thought when I played the beta. It was just refreshing, new. Yeah, we're pleased with it. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, so Go ahead, on, on the topic of uh, end game maps, uh, what are the stats of players maintaining high level maps? You guys have done a lot of tuning of the uh, balance of map drops and things like that now. Um, so what are the stats around what players, what sort of maps players are maintaining and uh, are they kind of, are those results similar to what your objectives were with the balance changes you've put into maps? So we found that players are stratif stratifying to tiers based on a combination of things. There's the items they've got, you know, people with better items do better maps. There's the risk profile, which is mostly important in Tempest, the players who have a higher standard deviation of deaths are playing in higher maps because they're pushing the characters. And generally skill, and skill can be measured in a lot of ways, you know, based on past experience and so on. But to cut a long story short, if you've got better items, you take more risks, and you are a better player, then you'll generally be in higher maps. And of course there's a lot of randomness. Maps is incredibly RNG here. So what, what's interesting though is we found that as players improve their items, change their risk profile, or in some cases actually develop new skills, it lets them climb to new higher tiers. And of course, there's a lot of randomness, so it's hard to draw conclusions, but we are pretty pleased with the fact that maps will put you somewhere based on what you can sustain and then let you improve it as you sink time into it. But, I mean, the system isn't perfect, right? We're getting a lot of feedback for and against the changes. Um, part of it's that you're not meant to be able to sustain 70, 90, 82 maps permanently, and especially not in the first two weeks of the expansion. You know, when we see people saying that they've run one level 81 map and they can't get another one and I look at this like day seven or something I'm thinking you're not really meant to yet you know there's there's several months left in these challenge leagues hmm okay um, so I, a lot of people are kind of citing different walls sorry my project uh, one of those being around 72 maps I didn't really I don't know I think I got maybe a little lucky around that point so I didn't really feel that wall but I'm hearing it from a lot of people have you guys like noticed any sort of wall and getting into that mid tier of maps that people might there be struggling are. with so if you imagine the maps as a pyramid where it's easier to ascend the low levels because the steep isn't as the slope the, the slope steepness isn't as bad and it's very hard to get through the top few levels because it's very steep and this affects the odds of finding higher maps and so on then the low level maps are easier and the slope does change at various points and it may be there's a break point at 72 but it's intended that players can coast up through the early section relatively easily and then there's the point where they have to start um, full clearing maps and or rolling a ton of mods on them and that kind of stuff in order to get a higher than average chance of progressing. I, I'm not aware of any like statistical wall at 72 that's particularly problematic. I mean, we're definitely seeing people in the mid-70s struggling to um, hit the tire, higher tiers if they have either been quite unlucky or aren't sinking enough currency in or taking the right risks. Hmm, okay. Uh, I have a question regarding to some of the new skills uh, being introduced. Um, skills like Frostblades, how do you guys feel overall with the introduction of Frostblades? Uh, the community is given pretty mixed opinions about it. How do you guys feel? We're pretty pleased with Frostblades. It does something that we, we needed a low-level skill to do. Um, we're partly going through the skills that players are introduced to in the first few levels and making sure they're as good as possible. And that we weren't happy with Fireball, for example, in the past. And I mean, after the success of Spectral Throw, we kind of feel that everyone needs an awesome skill to start with because 
you know, given that like half the players aren't going to make it past Brutus because of it being a free-to-play game and a lot of people wanted to try it out, having a nice punchy skill at the beginning is good. And Frostblades helped complete this cycle of you know, hybrid melee and um, projectile skills that we had for elemental attacks. And honestly, there's still a long way to go with every skill we introduce in terms of getting the balance just right in the long term and having it function mechanically correctly. But generally, people are pretty pleased with Frostblades. I find it I find it like a weird mechanic because you know something like lightning strike, which I feel is not used as much as other skills, where you can just hit the ground and you instantly see projectiles. Something like frost blades requires you to hit the target, then see the blades pop out. And if you have poor accuracy, or you're playing a crit build or something, you're not always going to have that come out. And it just feels it just feels like a little clunky. And I was wondering if there will be any kind of uh, you know if frost blades is going to get any other kind of work or anything like that later in the future. It's, it's very likely that skills will get work in the future, which is an easy answer for me to say, but it's not really answering your question. Um, <laughs> it's, meant to, it's meant to feel different than Lightning Strike, otherwise it would just be a cold version of Lightning Strike. And mm. while I'm sure some players would love to have each different skill represented in three different flavors to perfectly fit their builds, that's not really something that's going to happen in that way. And so I, I think that because Frostblades is a relatively new skill, there probably won't be changes to it in the very, very near future. But based on feedback over the course of, you know, the Awakening Challenge Leagues, there'll probably be modifications prior to the next ones. All right, cool. So then going back to kind of the new characters, you know, players who haven't played the game, the early game experience when you re-roll, uh, play in a new league, your hardcore character rips, which I've been quite familiar with recently, it's been lovely. Like the movement speed, some of the cast speeds, I know you've done a little bit to try to make the game feel more interactive, but like the base movement speed always feels extremely sluggish. Uh, obviously there's movement speed boots. Are, have you guys been happy with <coughs> how fast or how much utility these characters have just in movement or cast speed, attack speed? In general, yes, and I've got a slight uh divergent story here, which is about the concept of mastery behavior. And that's where, if you have a roguelike or an action RPG, you can often be a, you can often have a problem. Like an example is in NetHack, you might have one of those basilisks that turns you to stone. Or in Path of Exile, maybe you don't attack or move as fast as you'd like. And so there are generally in these kind of games a lot of tools for sorting it out. Like in NetHack, there are something like 11 different ways to deal with a basilisk, right? Like you can turn yourself to stone beforehand as a stone golem, and then you don't get hurt by it. Or you can drop it down a pit, or you can have a mirror, or various other things. So. You know, the player will learn different ways of addressing that problem. And with movement speed, we've got recipes that put move speed on boots. We have crafting mods. We have quicksilver flasks. We have transmutes. Um, the early levels are smaller. There's a lot of reasons why the player can. There's a lot of ways a player can overcome their movement speed issues. And them choosing one of these tools, especially yeah. in racing, where they have a decision between getting a quicksilver flask or getting something else, or using it to craft move speed onto boots, or drinking it outright. All of these choices mean that the player has a lot of ways they can solve movement speed, and we prefer that rather than just saying, oh, by the way, boots make you run faster now. So having you feel sluggish at the start is presenting a problem to the player that they will hopefully seek to solve with the tools that you've given them? Hopefully, and that one's not meant to be a particularly hard challenge for them to solve. I mean, yeah, it's frustrating on the first few levels before you find a tool and engage it, but then the act of conquering that is really cool. That's always been one of Path of Exile's things is that you feel quite... Well, you feel like a hobo at the start, and then <laughs> you eventually work your way into becoming a god, and you get a, a satisfying sense of progression. And that's usually one of the things I, you know, tout as being something I like about the game. But it's also something you guys have to balance, I guess, uh, about the start of the game not feeling, you know, just just too unpleasant. Like in the past, you've know, increased the attack speed on low tier weapons and things like that. Um, yeah. Have you guys ever considered the idea of having like implicit move speed on boots? We feel that's too easy as a tool. Um, and that the other ones are slightly more cool to do, you know, in terms of having to craft it on or get a flask and so on, or roll. I mean, you could definitely roll boost fit on boots. It's not too hard. It just requires, a, you know, foregoing some other mods, basically. Mm, okay, fair enough. All right, Ziggy, next one? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, in 2.0, the rarity of many uniques was rebalanced. Um, you guys released a, a bit of a list recently for this, but didn't really explain kind of what the goals behind the changes were. Um, I was curious if you could uh, sort of 
I guess, expand on that uh, that post to put out. So why some things were changed, like some of the standout uniques that uh, had they were already changed were like lip, kind of odd seeming things like leveling uniques like Bright Beak and Gold Rim uh, becoming really rare. And then uh, some things that people consider mandatory in the current meta, like Lightning Coil becoming rare as well, has obviously been talked about a lot. So uh, curious if you can share some of your goals behind that. So we've got over 400 uniques now, and uniques are generally introduced at one rarity and just kept there, and that gets kind of out of whack with our intention for the items over time. I mean, when we had 100 uniques in the game, those rarities don't necessarily work well in a relative sense with 400. And while the overall drop rate of uniques has been increased um, over time, and we bumped up the overall drop rate of uniques a whole bunch in the Awakening, especially because of the jewels, we did need to move things around where they were in the different tiers. And an example is Goldrum. The design team basically just felt there are far too many Goldrums floating around. Any player worth their salt has several, right? Mid players have, you know, one typically, and low players aren't finding it difficult to get one. So it was made a bit rarer. And it's not, I mean, I forget the exact number, so I may be misspeaking, but it's not that much rarer. It was just bumped in rarity. And it's worth noting that made rarer doesn't necessarily mean it was a particularly large increase. It's just that, yes, it now has changed which category it's in. And so it's, as part of the Awakening, the goal was this is the time where we can break stuff because there's a whole new game here, right? We're breaking so much stuff that players have to reevaluate things. And that meant that when we have a system like Unique Rarities that aren't even affecting existing character stats and so on, like Leech was, it was relatively straightforward to put them in the places where we feel it would be better for the game. And we understand that we're going to cop flack every time we do that, but part of the goal with doing it with the Awakening was that we then don't need to do it in the next expansion or whatever. We can we can just um, improve the game by adding new toys rather than changing the existing ones. And so the Awakening was ideally the last, but probably not the last, but an important time to change all the existing um, you know functionality of the way things work. Okay. I guess you're going to get hate mail no matter what change you do, so you just have to accept it yeah. and move on. As a side Is note, I kind of philosophically don't like showing drop rate changes like the patch note that one of the staff made about how the jack-in-the-box divination card had its drop rate reduced i disagreed with quite a lot but i mean it's nice for transparency but at the same time we're changing drop rates all the time and we basically never talk about it right things just change and we can do it without a patch we can do it server side you know it's just really odd to mention a particular one especially considering the furor it causes oh yeah Stealth that, that thing was stealth nerfs confirmed that thing was so <laughs> popular on release, and it was everywhere. Yeah. Well, here's an ex interesting <laughs> example about this, right? You can say, look, we made something rarer, and let's say you made it 5% rarer. That basically doesn't affect it, right? Instead of finding 20, you're finding 19 or something like that. So it's not a big change, but overall in the economy, it's nice to do it. And people will hear they made it rarer and completely <laughs> freak out. Like, I've got, I've got a good <laughs> contemporary example. Let's talk about Flame Totem for a second, right? All right. Oh, we, haven't, we, haven't, ooh, we haven't nerfed ooh, Flame ooh. Totem, because if we nerf Flame Totem, players are going to riot. Like, I can just imagine, let's say you have flame totem damage reduced by 5%. This is going to be ruined game, right, as far as they're concerned. Dead build. Like, when you guys yeah. fixed the, spec the, the specters, like, it wasn't even for the specters. The mobs were just really strong. And you even put in parentheses, this is not the specters. Dead build everywhere. All we saw was dead build. And it was like, really? Yeah, it's pretty powerful still. So, well, like, we're very... I got the flame totem. <laughs> The thing is, with like we, we fixed cast on crit um, a few seasons ago, and we saw a drop in the number of people playing the game that was measurable based on the fact <laughs> that they were playing a character, they were having fun, and now they're not because they perceive the fact. Like, bear in mind, this is a drop before the patch was released, right? Like, they hadn't had a chance to play it yet. So wow. it wouldn't, people in some cases didn't even log in to try their character again after perceiving that we ruined it. So we're a bit cognizant of this, and that's why, like, I, mean, I, I can't change player psychology, but I'd love to be able to say, look, this is only a change of a 3% magnitude. Please don't assume it ruined your character. But people don't like having power taken away from them. Do you ever mm. think about not ever telling people the balance changes with skills and just being like, there's a patch, find out? They will work it out because we try to be transparent with the damage that things do. Uh. And um, Sometimes, like, the problem is you'll get the first person to miscalculate it, will get it to the top of Reddit with the, you know, where it was an 80% reduction because they're missing a support gem or something like that. And, um, well, and it's a bit cynical of me to as ascribe that behavior. It is kind of disappointing to make a change and then decide the players will work it out and then they work out something much, much worse and you have to step in there and go, actually, guys, it's not that bad. We only made the small change here. And then, but the damage has already been dealt, yeah. I mean, to be it's, honest, um, though, Chris, like Flame ahead. Totem, and in regards to Flame Totem, if Flame Totem were to be nerfed, it would the next thing people would be crying about would be Cyclone. So you're always going to have a skill that's really strong and everyone calls overpowered. 
just leave yeah. it what it is. It's not I, Flame Blast, so hey, let's be happy. I like people <laughs> playing Flame Totem and having a good time. It's a skill that feels good. We're releasing a microtransaction for it today. I mean, it's... It's that's it's a good skill. <laughs> I, that was a joke by the time. I mean, we are releasing a microtransaction <laughs> today for sure, but it was a joke. Just having to get it. We're releasing a microtransaction for Flame Totem and buffing Flame Totem at the same time. <laughs> that's 300% more damage. <laughs> I'll, pl- I'll and plan a, with Flame and Totem. microtransaction. <laughs> I'll plan with Flame Totem is to see what happens over the course of this race season and see how much it dominates racing because that's very interesting feedback. And the other thing to note though is that Flame Totem is not particularly overpowered in maps. You know, it's mm-hmm. a great tool for getting to maps. It's good for there to be something like that in the game. For new players yeah, who say, what should I be playing? And then people um, you know, have to adopt a more complicated strategy in maps. And this seems pretty good, despite the fact the skill is objectively pretty damn powerful at the moment. Something yeah, um, the community not- generally uh, reacts well the the community generally dislikes like you guys not putting stuff in patch notes like stealth notes and things like that usually has a pretty bad rap but uh, when you guys do announce a change and you've talked about this a lot uh, when when you guys do announce a change uh, then it affects player behavior quite a lot even if the actual the actual percents or the actual magnitude of the change is not very large is it um, I imagine it's probably better for actual getting the actual sense of the new balance to not actually tell people and just have them continue to play their build and uh, a natural sort of reaction to happen, especially with things like item rarity and stuff. So, uh, yeah. I don't know, are you, how do you feel about that idea? Well, Path of Excel has a lot of spreadsheets, you know, the Path of Excel thing. So, when you're planning your build, we like to give you the real numbers so you can plan your build accurately. I mean, if you get told there's some change with how support gems work for your skills, that doesn't really help you plan what support gems to use. But for drop rates, people aren't I mean, maybe they are, but they shouldn't be making spreadsheets based on drop rates for stuff because we don't publish most of that, and we've taken large steps to make it non-data mineable. In fact, the anti-data mining stuff is is progressing relatively well. Um, you can't get drop rates of anything now, and we made sure with div cards to not leak the areas that they drop in when we were putting that system together. So we feel with item drops, if we control those behind the scenes, then people we're not making decisions based on item drops with regard to their actual play behavior, you know, in spreadsheets that require exact numbers. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah, it seems like, at least from the drop rate perspective, uh, that can be pretty well controlled and you can get kind of a bit more of a true sense. Um, However, just mentioning something in patch notes, I guess. So does that mean you guys probably, as you said, with the the jack-in-the-box thing, uh, mentioning on the patch notes was something you really wanted to do? Uh, Is that something you'll be trying to avoid in the future, do you think? Well, we like transparency, and many people did appreciate it. So, and it also kind of sucks if you make a character to farm a specific thing, and then you find out because of like results that you're not getting many. Like, if we're actually saying don't waste your time doing something anymore, then we'll probably say that. But in the case of the Jack in the Box thing, it wasn't a large, as large a reduction as many players calculated. I mean, there was a bit of hyperbole going on with a few calculations that I saw. Um, an example was in beta, we reduced the drop rate of the Dark Mage by like two and a half times or something, and. One user described it as 120 times with a calculation <laughs> explaining how they reached that. You know, I used to get a full stack an hour. Now I receive one per, you know, a single card per week or whatever the ratio was. So um, we'll probably continue to signal large changes. But it's worth noting, we make small changes, including positive ones, all the time. Like there'll be times where we go, you know what, people need more chaos orbs and we'll turn it up. And we don't patch note that. I mean, it would cause hysteria with us ruining the economy if we, you know, if we claim wow. that we're fiddling with rates. But we do fiddle with rates all the time. I had yeah. no idea about I that. I did yeah. not know that at all. <laughs> yeah, it feels like a lot of that sort of stuff has just been set in stone for a long time. And uh, any changes story. are just changes in the economy naturally happening. But uh, it's interesting that you guys are often little adjusting little things like that. It's like those Korean grinding mm. games, Chaos Orb Weekend. I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have pretty strong feelings about the whole weekend thing because Ugh. you can like really encourage people to play during prime time by putting buffs oh, yeah. on and stuff but it, it creates a thing where oh, it, it feels like it's pointless to not play you know it feels like it's, yeah, like it's pointless yeah. to play during the week so I'm not we a fan of like for... timed XP buffs and drop buffs and stuff like that oh, yeah. we prefer to say <laughs> any time is a good time to play Path of Exile is what we're saying I like that yes. I like that <laughs> alright let's talk about Tempest and Warbands in specific now uh, we got Tempest League coming up uh, my experiences with Tempest League is it's half the time I feel like it's just standard hardcore because I'll be farming a zone, you know, and that zone doesn't have an avid Tempest or I'm playing the game and then just I'll go three or four zones without it. Or other times it's every kind of sh- ground mixed together. I'll have shocking ground default on an ice ground map with 
morbid tempest and there's desecrated ground and i don't even know how to spell fps anymore like um <laughs> tempest overall i like it but there are times i think it's a little bit too much what is uh what is ggg's opinions on uh, tempest at the moment well tempest is actually a leak that i was responsible for like i typically don't get a design task where that's my feature but in the case of tempest that was assigned to me <clears throat> and there's a long long story behind that leak like it started out as one called eclipse that turned into Tempest actually relatively late in the process when we realized that the best part of Eclipse was the storms. And so, anyway, long story short, um, the goal was basically to have it that players could avoid challenge if they wanted to. In the past, we've said hardcore leagues have like Beyond or Invasion bosses, where the Invasion ones, invasion ones you're just going to run into randomly in the level. Beyond ones, you have to do some behavior to spawn, but that can kind of happen if you're not paying attention. Whereas with Tempest, you can absolutely avoid it 100%. It may just mean you have to play somewhere else for the time being. So we're experimenting with different ways of bringing the challenge to hardcore players. You know, do they opt in? Is it compulsory? And it's it's interesting, regardless of what we pick, people have the fondest memories of the leagues in the past while criticizing the current one. Um, Your example on Reddit recently of Anarchy, when someone's saying that oh, yeah. uh, Rogue Exile's spawning in every single zone, <laughs> like it was actually yeah. like a 5% spawn rate. <laughs> yeah. It was a uh, classic example of rose-tinted glasses, glasses there. Yeah, so with Tempest, it can be relatively unimpactful at the start if you're in areas that don't have it or if you're in areas where it doesn't particularly affect you, like if it does, you know, damage conversion in a way that, um, you know, is irrelevant to your build. And that's okay because it's just normal difficulty. But those things start to become pretty damn relevant once you're in Merciless and Maps. And a lot of the coolest, most rewarding tempers are those ones we put incredibly low spawn rates on and threw them in Maps so that... And the, the rationale for having the map only is so that you can't force spawn 100 areas of that type while the Tempest yeah. is on. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing some really cool screenshots of some pretty crazy stuff that happens on certain types of rare tempests. I, had, I love the ex exile maps. So I good. had exile and graveyard, and graveyard has like three divination cards that are worth it. And I was like, oh man, this is it right here. Um, but do you have anything about tempest that you're maybe not as happy with right now? That just needs a bit of work, in your opinion. Well, we've deployed quite a lot of changes to Tempest recently, as you'll note from like the G patch and a few before it. Like we've kind of flushed out a lot of the Tempest changes we were wanting to experiment with, and we're still waiting to get, um, we're still waiting to get feedback on a lot of those from people's play data over the weekend. So, I'm currently in a state of being happy with it, but may become unhappy once I see data. I don't know. We'll find out later on today, and we have more Tempests coming in the 201 patch, as I mentioned. Cool. Uh, Come on, so that. Another thing I want to ask about Tempest League. Um, right now, the prefixes are like the little swirly tempests that you can be mm -hmm. uh, affected by your mobs, and the suffixes yep. are like the the ground type effects, or they affect the tempest itself. Um, I noticed you can never have a suffix without a prefix in right. some of the maps. Uh, is that intended? Because I understand like of influence directly affects the spinny tempest, um, but things like desecrated ground, shocking ground, you know, you never just see those by themselves in a map. Is that intended that way? Right. Yeah, it's because the primary mechanic of Tempest is the prefixes, and for a long time they just had the prefix, it was just a type of Tempest. But we added the suffices in for two reasons. Firstly, because it creates variety, you know, it means that your your Fire Tempest has suddenly got ten different ways that it can be different, because maybe it's got, you know, um, animated weapons and stuff like that. But it's also because we wanted to reuse a lot of the other concepts from the Eclipse League. There were things um, that were pretty cool in there that couldn't be slotted directly into um, specific Tempests that affect an area at a time. Okay, that works. All right, Project Euro. So then we kind of touched on it earlier and you said you wanted to talk about it. There was the removal of eternal orbs. You did the post about it. They are not going to be dropping in the current leagues or permanent leagues, but you did say that depending on how things go, they could still be introduced. Do you want to talk more about eternal orbs and everything that happened about that? So we introduced eternal orbs in... Correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like 0.11.0 or something. It was the one that introduced um, Anarchy and Onslaught halfway through the open beta in like July. Anyway, um, so the intention there was basically, like naively, it was initially to help with people who were trying to get their sockets sorted out. And we also noted it as some pretty cool benefits with exalt crafting, but exalts are quite rare. As a relatively naive thing, you know, during development, thinking it was just going to be for sockets, and we had them priced really, really commonly on our internal server until people were crafting insane items using exalts on our internal server. So we realized it has to be you know, quite a lot rarer than an exalted orb, and so we implemented it as such, and we deployed it to the realm, and people were very happy because, of course, it lets them craft new and exciting things. And 
we didn't receive any negative feedback about this and time went on and we started to see what we call rare convergence which is the speed at which people make really good rares was really too high so there were a lot of things we can do to curb rare convergence and we didn't want to take eternals away and we, we liked how it was working and so on so over time we added you know we made some of the mods harder to get we added a few more mods that dilute the pool out slightly a bunch of stuff that we we're intending to do anyway to keep you know it being difficult to get the highest rares but Eternals kept relentlessly making it straightforward. And so we kind of knew we're probably going to turn these off at some point, but what's the right time for it? And we kept not turning them off in each set of challenge leagues, realizing the right time is probably when we introduce the Marraketh weapons and the new tier zero mods, because that's the point that, except for some leftover Eternal Orbs in Standard, and there really aren't that many, um, because people would generally spend them for crafting when they got them. Apart from those existing Eternal Orbs, it would you could essentially slow down the rate at which people got perfect Marraketh weapons and perfect items with tier zero mods on them. So that was why we picked the Awakening as the time to turn off Eternal Orbs. And we're quite happy to return them in the future if they're needed. It's just that so far it looks like they're not. Damn right they're not. <laughs> I'm, lo I'm loving, from a personal standpoint, as someone who's never used an Eternal Orb, <laughs> I'm loving the, uh, the, the changed feeling of the economy uh, without something like Eternals. The fact that you, you get an item that could be really good and, and it is that yeah, YOLO exalt feeling and you actually feel like you can do it. Like, not that you should sell it to someone else to Eternal. So, yeah, and, well, uh, personally loving that. There were two other things as well. One, philosophically, Path of Exos should involve you going through multiple different rare items in order to find the best one. The concept of get a single bow and just craft just that one item up to being perfect isn't really orthogonal to how action RPGs work with their crafting. I mean, when you're trying to find the perfect sword in Diablo 2, you have to see quite a lot of swords. And um, we felt that Eternals were really meaning it was kind of all in on one item. In addition, while we did consider the interaction between master crafting and eternal orbs, it was still probably too easy. A lot of those master meta mods reacted really brokenly with eternal, well, very brokenly, I mean, in an overpowered way with eternal orbs, and that was putting more um, wealth in the hands of the players who had the eternals. I've been um, happy with the change. Hmm. Yeah, I, but. Uh... We'll see. We'll see how it goes long term, I guess. Uh, back on the topic of warbands, uh, Ajito on Reddit asked, uh, or he mentioned that a lot of players are not feeling that they get enough warbands from their warbands league. Uh, you show up, for example, he says, you show up at a max level captured zone hoping to find a general, and uh, often you don't. And he says that he feels like it's a very lackluster experience. Uh, how are you guys feeling about uh, warbands at the moment and the uh, community reactions to it? So I believe that his comment was actually predating, was before the 200G patch, from what I understand. Mm. So I'd yes, like to say 200G had, um, addressed this. Part of the reason is we did a bunch of simulations of warbands, um, and we, based on the simulations, increased the rates a fair amount, especially in maps. So um, people who were having not enough warbands before should hopefully have a better experience with G. And this is one of those things where I'll look at the data from over the weekend um, today with the guys and see how good it is. But hopefully it's a lot better. Um, so the kind of like it, there's an interesting difference between Tempest and Warbands, where uh, Warbands had these like unique, uh, its its own set of uniques uh, that drop specifically from its mechanic, and then uh, they also had the unique mods that ro uh, roll on blue items. Um, and then whereas Tempest has kind of got more its its unique Tempest mods that you can go hunt down, some of those are very rewarding. Uh, it's very it's a very different mechanic. Uh, very difference in a uh, very big difference in the like the looting mechanics between the two leagues compared to previous challenge leagues. Um, was that kind of like, I guess, what was the idea behind making them so different this time around, rather than having something kind of like equivalent between them two? They're not really very comparable. We felt that warbands had to drop exclusive stuff in order to be interesting because items are the best motivation. And while we added new uniques to Tempest, I think this four, I could be wrong, but either way, but while there's new uniques in Tempest, we didn't particularly want them to come just from the Tempest themselves. We like the idea mm. of people getting them just generally for playing the league, like we typically do. And so, likewise, we wanted some Tempests that affected item drops in a rewarding way, partly because it's got that experience of, you know, you playing the game at one in the morning and then an amazing Tempest comes on and you have a pile of that map, so you wake your friend up and say, let's get rich together and, you know, run a bunch of that <laughs> map for an hour. So, we... We did. We, we separately and independently designed both of the ways that the items are rewarded in these cases, and they're not really comparable to each other. But that's just because those two leagues aren't the same league. You know, we like to offer different things at different times. I got a question for you, Chris. Um, with 2.0 coming out, we have jewels. Um, 
And with jewels and flasks being, you know, one of those things that are really fun to roll and you can use alterations effectively. And we haven't really seen a Forsaken Master since PvP. Are the chances of us getting a new Forsaken Master in the imminent future looking pretty good? That's a good question, and honestly, we haven't really made a decision on that. I mean, it's the kind of thing where, yeah, honestly, I'd expect more in the future. It's just we don't know what form that's taking, right? Like, we, we don't particularly want it to be that every time we release a big patch, we should want a Forsaken Master, and we'd rather have some kind of consolidated content. But then it's too easy to do a Forsaken Masters... Sorry, it's too early to do a Forsaken Masters 2 kind of thing. I mean, that's not really treading any new ground. <laughs> so I don't know what form other Masters will come in. They may just come standalone. They may come with more content. I'm not sure. And to follow up with Jules, um, considering now Gem Cutter's lockboxes have lost a lot of their uh, lack, you know, they're just, they just feel lackluster with all the uh, gem vendors out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you think maybe in the future you might be able to implement kind of jewels added to that lockbox? That's not a bad idea. I mean, we've seen it suggested a couple of times, and it makes sense given the fact that the gems themselves, I mean, you pretty much just open them to get quality ones, I guess. So. Um, yeah, that's about it now. Yeah. <laughs> or level or experience. Fair enough. There has been discussion of. Um, adding jewels to strong boxes, but we haven't yet decided which form that wants to be in. I mean, there's problems where because jewels don't have quality themselves, it kind of or experience those mods would do nothing on it. Like it may be cleaner to implement a new type of strong box. That's true, but I mean, like at the same time, you could get plus to chest level. That really doesn't do anything to gems either. Well, I'm not sure if that even shows up on there. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. Okay, I don't know. so here's a here's something I've been really wondering about. Actually, is on the topic of divination cards. Um, initially when divination cards were announced and uh, we started seeing in the beta some being dropping in lower difficulties and stuff, I was thinking that the, the idea would be that um, things that would be restricted to like a lower difficulty zone, would uh, the penalty to farming that would be that you wouldn't get very good currency and loot at the same time as farming that. However, then on top of them, uh, divination cards are also affected by currency drop rate penalties as well. Uh, what's kind of like the idea behind having some cards that only drop in like lower level zones and then um, also have the currency drop rate penalty applied to them? So very few cards are actually like that and it's none of the chase ones, like none of the ones for actually good uniques. It's mostly remedial kind of ones um, aimed at people who are playing through legitimately. And so okay. the goal here is to reward people who are playing correctly in that content, and most people do. And you can think of it like this. If we made it so that there was no penalty whatsoever, and when you kill monsters there's an equal chance of getting those cards, then people would run through, and you could do some pretty pretty silly stuff in little areas, right? You can, like, chain flicker strike across the map, and or you can, you know, flame dash your way, killing groups of monsters <laughs> at a time with some skill. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not particularly hard to clear low-level zones, uh, if you go full on move speed, full on glass cannon, nothing can hurt me. Kind of build, and so farm taste those cards, <laughs> yeah, those cards would then get pretty over farmed, and so we can of course nerf them in response. But then we're stuck in a cycle where now the one target audience of the low level players we're actually aiming for don't find those cards. So we prefer to give a really good yield of the cards for low level players who are playing through, giving them a chance to stop and farm for a while, um, rather than having it so that high level players can come and mess up the game for them. A lot of people in chat are mentioning uh, Ta- Z? I think Ziggy Case cut of out. Hate oh, there we go. as oh. being one of those options. Is in this case, or in cases like that, it potentially just being a, a balancing factor? This is uh, where did I'm my mic cut out? Are we good? Yeah, Can you hear me? Hello? <laughs> We're, you're good now. Chris quickly Google. Am I back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good? Okay. Uh, did you get... <laughs> oh, are we all good? All right, we're back. <laughs> See, you're you're good. like lagging. Your video and voice are completely oh, no. off sync. So, no. let's have Chris right, answer the question. Me. Skip me. Um, I'm, I'm aware what the taste of hate is the the flask we introduced um, for the race season, but I haven't actually become aware of what it does. So, I can't answer your question. <laughs> right. And then, so going on to a bit of a different topic, uh, we have some kind of summoner concern, and it was related to having control over minion movement and a lot of the community has felt the problem is when you're trying to move your character to progress you're going to end up running into the fact that you try to move forward then your zombies follow you rather than attacking mobs so then you have to sit still and your minions start attacking when you re-attack and then if you try to move again your all your minions will kind of anti-lock on and just run back with you how does ggg feel about the um interaction between kind of the minion AI for players right now? 
So we have a lot of discussion about this kind of thing in the office. And the first thing to note is that the Minion players right now, even after the Revenant nerf, are in a really strong place, right? Like, there's the question of if we do further increase their power by giving you more control, then that's buffing a really dominant build at the moment. Now, I agree, the game shouldn't be frustrating. So it may be the correct thing to do is to say, look, we've removed some frustrations, but in return, we have to adjust the balance in some other way with regard to these characters. Having said that, we haven't really decided anything, and this is partly because we're not sure what path to take with removing the frustration. Um, the game isn't an RTS, so we'll never give players direct control over the minions. The intention isn't that they can select minions and tell them specifically to go places. I mean, the offerings and the fact that they target what you're targeting are kind of there to achieve that. Now, the AI is something that the guys are constantly looking at, and it received quite a few improvements with the Forsaken Master. Uh, sorry, with the Awakening release, especially because of the introduction of golems and so on. Um, there's discussion of adding, say, an aggressive support gem that you just socket next to your minions, which makes them a bit stronger and all more aggressive, and you can have a defensive equivalent so that you can kind of fine-tune which of your minions are in the forefront and which aren't. Um, there's also various considerations with the way the grace period interacts with minions that um, are currently being discussed. Good. Mm -hmm. That one's very important. Mm. That was the one thing I noticed straight away is playing a summoner for the first time. Hopefully, my I'm actually working now. <laughs> you are. I got nerfed. Yay! <laughs> I got nerfed as well. Yeah, having uh, I zoned into a, one of the new maps with um, the the teleporty replicating archer boss from uh, Dried Lake and uh, on the loading screen, and I loaded in, and all my minions were dead. <laughs> <laughs> it was the saddest moment as a summoner. I'm like, I just spent five minutes getting them all. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so I got two questions left for you, uh, Chris. Um, one being the current state, the dynamic meta shift you guys are a big fan of. It seems to be armor is back. It's no longer just path of armor or path of iron reflexes, but it seems to be a lot of people think it's the only option. Obviously, caster defenses are in a pretty rough spot with the change to uh, Eldritch Battery as well as Leech. Um, are you guys happy with the current uh, meta revolving around armor? There's a lot of discussion about this, which I've both been part of and have been overhearing, and the team are kind of... They have different opinions depending on who you talk to, and some people believe it's actually okay, and those are generally the people that play the game, which is interesting. The people who are less happy with it are the ones that are reading the forums in terms of our staff members. Now, this is very telling because I have to kind of come in and try to help the people make a conclusion. I'm more inclined to side with the people that have experience playing a lot of maps at the moment. There is a lot of discussion of helping improve various types of defenses and part of the rationale with the changes that were made to them was that previously it was quite easy to get certain defenses allocate a few points get a very strong defense now it requires more speciality and maybe it requires too much this is something that's an ongoing discussion i think that personally i would prefer that leech was slightly stronger but because of the fact that it requires rescaling values on items that's not a change we're going to make off the cuff to try it out because you know suddenly yes. your you know 0.8 percent becomes 0.9 percent and it's confusing so there will be some testing of this kind of stuff before anything makes its way onto the realm and i can't guarantee anything right my opinion only matters like 10 percent here because these guys actually do this for a job whereas i mostly do paperwork and scheduling and coming on podcasts and stuff as my job so um, <laughs> I, I do respect what they well, think about so. it you Thanks. do a good job of it, guys. <laughs> well, I used to do the balance stuff. Back in the pre-093, I was a primary balance guy, and then Carl took over with me supervising, and now I kind of try to stay out of his way for the most part while he leads his team. Good stuff. Hmm. Um, the last question I have for you is uh, one of the very first interviews you have ever done, um, be even before State of Exile, you mentioned that uh, Grinding Your Games has been planning to do a 10-act for Path of Exile. Is that still in your guys' vision? The internet we never have, forgets. We have a ton of ideas for future acts, and um, we intend to keep making them. Now, acts take a really long time, it turns out, with The Awakening. I mean, that took like two years to get finished. So, doing 10 acts, if we have another 15 to go, well, that's going to be 30 years. And if we're still receiving money and still able to make the game, that's totally cool. Um, I'm looking forward to that. The, the question is, basically, what we're doing with other padding in the meantime, right? Like, you guys don't want there to be a two-year gap, and then there's another act with no, you know, important patches. So we're going to have to release some stuff in the future, and it's just a question of people's expectations, understanding that um, both, you know, don't expect a um, an act out of nowhere, you know, in, in a few months, and also, um, you know, understand the Awakening took quite a lot of time over several years to make. Well, it's good to know that you guys have plans for more acts and that this isn't the final bout. But right now we're in Act 4 and we should enjoy the heck out of the Awakening and everything that's got. 
Um, I'm assuming later on in the future you might do like a Forsaken Masters type thing before Act 5 ever gets mentioned, you know, kind of like a midway thing like um, its Siri was and things like that. But uh, we appreciate the content that you're doing. As I've been telling the community out there, this is a free DLC, a free DLC expansion. This is more than any other company will give you for free. So be proud of it. Now, if you're not happy with the game, you know, find a way to play it. Or, heck, don't play it. But overall, it's a free DLC. This is What company out there does this nowadays? So I'm appreciative of it, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome. And we'll keep producing quality content. We've got a lot of interesting updates um, planned for the the Awakening, um, both on 201 relatively soon and also 202 going forward. And I should Willing note, like, 201 anything? is not... Well, <laughs> I've talked quite a lot about the 201 content, and I think there's more than one map being worked on, so there's definitely an emphasis on new in-game content coming. The 201 patch is actually aimed for relatively soon, like next week kind of thing, so it's it's pretty soon now. Awesome stuff. Can't wait. Can't wait to see what those new tempos are. <laughs> Hoping something on the something on the level of rogue exiles everywhere. <laughs> Loving it. <laughs> All right. We have anything else before uh, Chris? Would you like to say anything before you uh, head out? Um, I've said pretty much everything that I intended to. Thanks very much for the time, guys, and thanks to the community for their support and um, you know ongoing playing of the game and so on. And thanks for coming on, Chris. Good to be here, man. Remember, pa Path of Exile is a free-to-play game. You can find it on Steam or PathofExile.com. Great. Well, thanks very much for your time, guys. Cheers, man. Okay, take care. Bye.